act like this. And we've taken uh, precautions to limit the number of people in here. Uh, Michelle, and thanks to Michelle and Carly for setting this up and spreading us out and checking your campus badges and vaccination cards and all that. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to be back. I don't have any other announcements other than for this seminar series, we're going to take it week by week and defer to the wishes of the speakers. And so for those speakers who are willing to come and do it in person, that's what we'll do, always with the Zoom option. And for those uh, who uh, can't travel or uh, prefer to do it by Zoom, we'll, we'll accommodate those. Uh, but campus is, is back, classes are in person, this is a class, and that's how we will proceed. Let me ask if there are any announcements before I get started. Jim. I'd like to introduce Umi Leila, who's a postdoc who's been officially a postdoc in my lab for like two years now, but has finally been able to actually come to America. And so uh, she's got an office that's next door to mine on the opposite side of the museum. Welcome, Umi. <laughs> she gets the award for the longest hassle with HR <laughs> ever. Yes. <laughs> But we're okay. delighted that you're here. So <laughs> that's you. that's great. Anything else? Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, on the same note, I'll introduce you to Tom Jersey, who uh, started in November uh, and is a postdoc in my lab on the Cell Fellowship. Uh, she works in biology uh, and stable isotope analysis. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, Inga. And she is giving NBC lunch next week. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm just going to encourage everyone at the end when you have questions uh, to speak up uh, because we're all masked and it's hard to understand each other and we've got this mic up here. So I hope I hope that works. All right. Anything else? What a pleasure to introduce Michael Torelli uh, today to kick off our return to in-person seminars. I can't think of a, a better uh, speaker. Uh, if we didn't have all these precautions and Zoom things in place, this room would be packed, I'm sure of it. Uh, and it probably is packed on Zoom. Uh, Michael, well, he, he got his undergraduate uh, degree from UC Riverside in mathematics. He then did a PhD with Joe Felsenstein and was Joe's first PhD student. Uh, and then uh, went directly uh, from the University of Washington to uh, UC Davis, where he's been his professor ever since. Uh, I believe you also founded the population biology program at, at Davis, which is an incredible uh, program, as everyone knows, and, and has served as a model for similar programs at other, other places. Uh, scientifically, uh, Michael wears many hats and uh, is impressive for the breadth of his uh, contributions uh, to ecology and evolutionary biology, including theoretical <clears throat> ecology, niche modeling, uh, the maintenance of polygenic traits in natural populations, quantitative genetics, uh, speciation, uh, uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility in Wolbachia, uh, and Wolbachia, and work that has led to uh, uh, practical control of dengue uh, through uh, Wolbachia uh, in natural populations. And this is what we heard about last time you spoke to us, which was, I don't know, when was that? Five years ago? Some, some, something like that? We weren't wearing masks. <laughs> that, that much I know. Uh, Michael has worn, won many awards uh, uh, and was elected to the National Academy fairly recently, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, we are just uh, thrilled to have you here. I won't take any more of your time. The floor is yours. Thank you. So let's start with a uh, happy anniversary, Professor Torelli. Uh, so this, uh, I was, uh, became a professor at Davis exactly uh, 45 years ago today. <laughs> and the first talk I ever gave as a seminar speaker was here at Berkeley in the, in the old zoology department. And for me, the most memorable, at that time I was a theoretical ecologist, the most memorable thing was uh, George Oster walking out of the room after 45 minutes when I was making fun of his pal Bob May. So uh, just for old time's sake, I strongly recommend that all of you walk out of the room in 45 minutes <laughs> or whenever I say anything that offends you. Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, what I want to talk about today is give you an overview of some new ideas about old observations. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my favorite organism, uh, the red dots here. Uh, those are those, so this is a syncytial blastoderm of Drosophila. These are the nuclei. The red dots are the Wolbachia. Uh, if you don't know, Wolbachia are in about half of all uh, insects and many other non-insect arthropods. Uh, I discovered them in Drosophila with my first postdoc, Mari Hoffman. There's Drosophila simulans in the natural habitat. This is a Melanogaster syncytial blastoderm. And the reason people really give a shit about Wolbachia now is that we stably transformed Aedes aegypti so it doesn't transmit things. So I'll give you an overview of that stuff. But what I'm going to talk about today is the most famous phenomenon caused, caused by Wolbachia called cytoplasmic incompatibility, which I'll explain. Now, I'll argue that this extraordinarily a common phenomenon cannot be explained by natural selection, cannot be explained by natural selection, but can be explained by a higher level process, a so-called played selection process. It sort of sounds like bullshit. Right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll argue that this is really the way the world works. The reason I get to pretend to be an experimentalist is because of this guy. This is my first postdoc, Art Hoffman. Hoffman doing what he always does, uh, writing a paper. He's now, since he was my postdoc, uh, 35 years ago, he published a thousand papers. A shocking number of them was great. I've had extraordinary, <laughs> I've had extraordinary luck with postdocs. This is my most recent postdoc, uh, Brandon Cooper, doing fieldwork in Africa. Yes, Brandon, it is nine feet tall. Uh, <laughs> And so many of the papers I'll talk about that were done with Brandon. And this is a former undergraduate of mine, Will Connor, who did all the bioinformatics stuff I tell you about. And this is my pal, Scott O'Neill, with a big shitty grin uh, on O'Neill <laughs> Street. This, this, is, this is in Jorky's uh, uh, Knob in Queensland, Australia. Jorky's Knob is famous. For the place where the cane toad was first released. Okay. And actually, that's where we first released Wolbachia in nature <laughs> for a slightly different reason. Uh, and here's my close friend, the world's smartest man, WSL, Nick Barton, uh, who worked on what I call Bartonian waves of advanced for dissertation explaining hybrid cells. Now, the reason we get money, that's annoying. At the top. You can make it disappear. If you click those three dots, there's more. I think there's an option that says hide channel. Yeah, the problem is I don't see those on my screen. Here, just go ahead, keep talking. Anyway, I'll, I'll take uh, care of it. So, <laughs> so because um, my friends Bill and Melinda Gates have given Scott $150 million, uh, we're transforming 80. So we've taken, we've taken. O'Neill's lab put the Wolbachia from Drosophila melanogaster into Aedes aegypti. When you do that, it no longer transmits dengue fever. Okay, we're doing that in populations around the world, and it actually suppresses it actually suppresses dengue. It actually works. So the paper that appeared in the Lincoln Journal uh, this summer, showing like this 60% uh, decrease uh, in this checkerboard, and you only get dengue. You know, Sorry about that. Some fraction of the time at your house, you can get it when you're somewhere else. Anyway, we're actually controlling dengue using the robot. And here we are, and I, uh, his student, uh, uh, Karan Ross, wrote a review article in Annual Review of Genetics about using Wolbachia for disease control and to control insect pests. So, uh, so <laughs> I like to build the punchline. Uh, summary conclusion. <laughs> so my claim to fame as experimentalist is that Ari and I were the first people to show these maternally inherited bacteria, Wolbachia, spreading in nature here in California. I'll show you those old data. Uh, and always I interpreted that as what I call a Bartonian wave of advance. So the reasons I'll explain, 
We thought that these lobotomy had deleterious effects on their hosts, but because of this phenomenon called cytoplasmic incompatibility, they could spread anyway once they got sufficiently treated. Okay. It took 20, 23 years to discover that that's almost surely wrong. That in fact, Wolbachi are doing, a, well, it's still true that Wolbachi are doing loads of things that we don't know about that make them almost surely, almost always mutualistic. So that even when they're very rare, they're helping those females produce more progeny. And I'll show you the data. In contrast, when we as experimentalists introduce Wolbachi in some other taxa, moving it from melanogaster into a chipton, those are in fact more telling you. They're very serious. They induce a fitness cost on the order of 20%, and they only spread in nature when they get sufficiently treated. So there's very different dynamics between natural Wolbachia infections and Wolbachia transfections. The most famous phenomenon before, before we knew that they suppressed disease transmission, the most famous phenomenon associated with Wolbachia is this phenomenon called cytoplasmic incompatibility, which I'll explain in detail. And that's the phenomenon I want to talk about. Why is this phenomenon? Infected male makes an uninfected female, many of her offspring die. Why is that so common? Okay. Wolbachia are in about half of all insects. About half of those Wolbachia infections are associated with significant cytoplasmic incompatibility. And I will argue, well, I did argue in 1994, that you cannot explain that phenomenon with natural selection. If you look at natural selection within a population of Wolbachia and have it in a host, natural selection does not favor cytoplasmic incompatibility. Uh, well, why is it there? Why is it there? I will argue that the book associated with some form of plate selection associated with differential rates of transmission and persistence within those species. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so plate selection, what are the, what are the components of this idea? Uh, uh, first, I believe, contrary to what I said for my first 23 years of talking about Wolbachia. So Ari and I discovered Wolbachia in Drosophila simulans here in California in 1985. And that was about the fourth example known of Wolbachia and cytoplasmic incompatibility in natural populations. I will argue that most of those infections, most of those infections in nature are in fact Bisharian in the sense that they spread when they're very rare, not Bartonian associated with bistable state, where zero is stable and some high equilibrium frequency is stable. Uh, I'll tell you about the tempo and mode of Wolbachia acquisition. This is all genomics. I mean, no way I could have given this talk five years ago. This is all based on genomic analysis. How do we know when a Wolbachia infection was acquired? We know that now only because of comparative genomics, looking at timing for of the Wolbachia, mitochondria, and nuclear genotypes to hosts. And those data indicate that most Wolbachia infections, most Wolbachia infections seem to be quite young, on the order of a thousand to a hundred thousand years old, much shorter than the time scale of speciation is on the order. Of 100,000 to a million years. Uh, and they're acquired, where do Wolbachia infections come from? A lot of it comes from introgression between close related species and horizontal transmission between distantly related species, almost surely mediated by parasitism. Uh, Again, couldn't have given this talk a few years ago, the genetics of cytoplasmic incompatibility. How about the phenomenon of cytoplasmic incompatibility? Infected male makes with an uninfected female. Most of her embryos die or a significant fraction of them die. Uh, what's, what's that caused by? It's caused by these cassettes of two loci, these so-called SIN or SID or SIF loci, cytoplasmic incompatibility inducing loci, or functioning loci. Uh, 
And those, those loci exist within phage, within Wolbachia. This was all discovered by this crazy guy, uh, John Beckman, by the graduate student, and a follow-up work by uh, uh, Jack Warren student, uh, Seth Gordon student. Uh, so, phenomenology about cytoplasmic incompatibility. Some theory, uh, what cytoplasmic incompatibility does is to raise equilibrium frequencies within populations. A Wolbachia that causes cytoplasmic incompatibility will be found within a species generally at frequencies above 80%. Non-CI Wolbachia tend to be much, much less common for these species. And I'll show you the cytoplasmic incompatibility helps Wolbachia persist, persist uh, within host species. So Wolbachia that cause the are more likely to spread because they're much more common within hosts, higher frequencies within population, and because they persist much longer. Persist much longer because they can persist even when they become deleterious to the host. So I'll explain the plan. Yeah, so what is going on? are generally neutrally transmitted. Every once in a while, they're horizontally transmitted, but mainly you get it from your mom. Uh, they're related, so alpha proteobacteria are related to the Ketsia. Uh, they're extremely common. About half of all insect species have, have Wolbachia, and non insect uh, uh, arthropods have them. They also, crustaceans, paleo nematodes. Uh, best guess about 50%. Uh, but on an evolutionary time scale, they're horizontally transmitted. And this was first, so O'Neill, who now runs this Eliminate Dengue program, has got you know, probably a couple hundred million dollars by now. What O'Neill's initial claim to fame was to develop PCR primers for Wolbachia. So this, was, this was a very cool thing to do. Back in 1992, when Scott was a postdoc, uh, he developed the primers uh, that allowed them to do some sequencing and showed that very distantly related, related hosts had closely related Wolbachia. So deep discordance between Wolbachia phylogeny and host phylogeny, suggesting horizontal transmission on an evolutionary time scale. Very little horizontal transmission on an ecological time scale. We have loads of data from many populations. <laughs> and this is a slide by my postdoc Brandon showing you many of the cutest insects you've ever seen in your life. And for every half of our insect species. Uh, what do they do? What do all black do? Well, they're associated with many different phenomena, but their most common phenotype is cytoplasmic incompatibility. Roughly half of all. Wolbachia infections are associated with cytoplasmic incompatibility. This used to be hard work. You had to do crosses. Now we can just look at the CI causing loci and see if they're intact or not and predict whether or not a new Wolbachia infection that we've never studied will cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. Do they have functional CI loci? I did not say the CI loci come in pairs, one of which is a toxin, the other is an antidote. And you will see that there are many, many cases of cytoplasmic incompatibility being lost on a time scale of thousands or tens of thousands of years. What that means is the toxin gets killed, the antidote never gets killed. Can you see why? Uh, besides cytoplasmic incompatibility, uh, they can do male killing. And it's the same little body that can do these things with some different loci involved. Uh, in some taxa, they cause parthenogenesis and some feminization. That's not only an arthropod. I'll be focusing on cytoplasmic incompatibility. About half of the normal body infections cause CI, cytoplasmic incompatibility, on the order of 10% male killing. These are very good. Very good. Just a few examples to know. Well, body infections are known to both increase and reduce female fecundity. They can dramatically reduce longevity especially will buy the trans infections. In many taxa, not in many taxa, in some taxa, most famously, filarial nematodes, they become obligate. So you see
see co-speciation of Wolbachia and host. Most mainly when we build trees of Wolbachia, they're much, much shallower than the host. The Wolbachia have been relatively recently acquired. I'll show you on data. The most famous new phenotype uh, is parasite protection. Wolbachia can protect their host, hosts from viruses, mycoplasma, and nematodes. Okay. They're eternally transmitted. They want mom to be happy and healthy and produce more kids. So in a heart of hearts, I believe we'll walk the mutuals. So what is cytoplasmic incompatibility? First described by the Van Laven and the mosquito Chilicrippians. So we'll walk is called Chilicrippiensis. We'll walk you were first described in Culex uh, in the 1930s by her taking this graduate Wolbach in his graduate student church name, just saw them. They were looking at mosquito cells, tulip cells under the microscope, said, what the hell are these bacteria doing living in these in these insect cells? And so they named them, uh Herkin named them after his major friend the Wolbach, Wolbach, yeah. The first phenotype associated with them was by this guy Lobin. Lobin didn't realize that the phenotype he studied was caused by Wolbachia. That was done by Frank Barr and his postdoc Yen at UCLA in the early 1970s. But here is the phenomenon. Uh, so we have two flavors of individuals, uh, uninfected and infected, uninfected, uninfected fine, infected by infected fine, uh, infected female by uninfected male fine. It's maternally transmitted. So all the progeny here, almost all the progeny are infected. Uh, infected male by uninfected female, that's what reduces uh, reduced progeny. The reduced progeny number is extraordinarily variable. It's under control both of the Wolbachia and the host. It can range from a 5% reduction to an elimination of all of, all of the offspring. So in mosquitoes, CI is always complete. In Drosophila simulant, my favorite organism, half of the offspring die. In Drosophila melanogaster, about 10% die, very few die. So uh, this causes Wolbachia spread. So here's a model for the population dynamics of Wolbachia infections that takes into account that Wolbachia can affect female paternity. Wolbachia are not perfectly maternally transmitted. Some fraction of the ova produced by a female will not contain Wolbachia, and that varies dramatically across taxa. In my favorite organism, the Shuffle simulants here in California, about 5% of the ova are uninfected. In Melanogaster, it's about 5%. In mosquitoes, it's much less than 1%, like on the order of 0.5%. Uh, if you jack up temperature, you do a whole bunch of things to radically increase the level of imperfect maternal transmission. So mu is, mu is a fraction of uninfected over being by infected female. And the last parameter, the magic parameter, uh, H, the relative hatch rate from the incompatible cross, or SH, the fraction of embryos killed by cytoplasmic incompatibility. The big thing is, just refer to what the frequency of the next generation by the function of frequency in the current generation, relative fecundity, imperfect transmission, uh, and the level of cytoplasmic incompatibility. And the answer is, if a Wolbachia infection is there, there's no cytoplasmic incompatibility. There are very few incompatible crosses. The Wolbachia infections are there, uh, they increase only if the relative fecundity of infected females times a fraction of her offspring that are infected is bigger than one. If that's true, we'll call the Wolbachia for sharing because they will take off in the rear. If that's less than one, that means Wolbachia we'll have to get sufficiently frequent that the uninfected females are suffering from matings with infected males killing their progeny. We'll call those Bartonian. That's my pal in Barton, who studies these under systems and uh, uh, 
karyotypes of grasshoppers for its gradual way. So Bartonian waves, things that are Bartonian will spread as long as the unstable forms are less than a half, and as long as you strike them in an initially uh, large enough space. Anyway, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. So, uh, you know, experimental claim to fame, R and I uh, set out to look at something else. We're looking at the genetics of adaptation to different fruits by Drosophila. So we were doing what you're not supposed to do. Uh, we're comparing orange, uh, oranges and apples. We had flies <laughs> grown on oranges, flies grown on apples, and we showed that they were differentially adapted. We're geneticists. We had read this paper by Mendel. The first thing you do is we circle the crosses and see if the F ones look the same in both directions. We were shocked to find uh, that when we took Southern California uh, males, made it Northern California females, all the projects died. Okay? I called it my pal Coin, who taught me, I mean, I'm the math major. Coin taught me how to do experimental work when he was a graduate student at Davis. And Coin, what's going on here? He said, well, Mike Wade just discovered exactly the same phenomenon in Tribolia. And his phenomenon is that in his in Tribolia is caused by this microbe called Wolbachia. If yours is Wolbachia, you can cure it with tetracycline. That's the cute, cool thing about Wolbachia. You can get rid of it whenever you want with the tetracycline treatment. Uh, we did it, and it was Wolbachia. So just you know, get lucky. Good to have smart friends. Uh, so the first thing we did was to study what was going on in California, doing estimates in the field of how the Wolbachia population dynamics. We showed that Wolbachia were imperfectly maternally transmitted. In simulants, about 95% of the uh, ovo produced by a female are infected, and the Lanagaster about that in mosquitoes is about 99.9%. .9 we quantified cytoplasmic incompatibility in nature by doing crosses in nature between infected and uninfected. And you know, we did the four reciprocal process. And in simulants, it dramatically depends on, uh, depends on male age, but on average over the age distribution of males in nature, about half of the embryos produced by an incompatible cross infected males and uninfected females die. The other thing we did, I mean, this is, you know, this is, Mid 1980s, nobody had ever studied Bulbachia in nature. Uh, we collected wild caught females to test whether they were infected versus uninfected. Back to the bad old days, we did this by progeny testing. Now we all do PCR. And we showed that infected females were on the order of 10 to 20% less feed time. <laughs> so there's less feed time, and, and not all its offspring have this. So we said, it's got to be Bartonian. It's got to be, I mean, all our data suggested that they were Bartonian. Uh -huh. And then we watched this famous wave of advance through California over just a few years. I mean, like, how fucking lucky. I mean, I, I you know my, I'm in a new kid doing my first experiment, and we watched this incredibly cool wave in nature that's just streaming through California at about 100 kilometers per year. So we got to document. You know, drive up and down the state collecting flies and, and watch it spread. And then it settles down to this equilibrium of about 95%, which you can explain in terms of the level of CI, the level of imperfect maternal transmission. So we were pretty happy that we understood fairly deeply the population biology of this thing and seeing that we were documenting the Bartonian waves. Now, uh, again, for two reasons, imperfect transmission and the infected females were producing pure eggs. Uh, but, but I, you know, I'm just generally a lucky person. Uh, I'm visiting Arianus, so Ari is a professor in Melbourne. I'm visiting Melbourne, I visit Melbourne as often as I can. I just got there, and Ari said, I have this brand new graduate student. Would you please talk to him about possible? Dissertation projects, like a new graduate student with Peter Chrysler. Uh, I said, Peter, you should look at these infections in nature here in Australia. So Ari, he was my postdoc for a year and a half, went back to Australia as a professor. 
He looked for our infection in Drosophilus and so Drosophilus stimulants, if you don't know, like Melanogaster, is a you know, trash species that's everywhere in the world. Uh, Ari goes back, stimulants is everywhere, looks for cytoplasmic incompatibility, none. Okay. O'Neill gives in PCR primers. So O'Neill was extraordinarily generous, gave us primers before he even published it, so we could start looking at other species. And Ari found an infection, another infection in Drosophila simulans that did not cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. So not all will block, say uh, roughly half of will block you on cytoplasmic incompatibility. The first thing I said in Australia was this non-CI causing will block it, called WAU in, in simulants. And they both show imperfect maternal transmission. Uh, yeah, so Ari discovered both both infections, but he also found uh, a black infection in top of Lanagaster, and he found this non CI positive infection in Simulus. Now, how does that go? You know, why would so how does the how does black infection live if it's not causing cytoplasmic compatibility? Answer it lives by being a mutualist, it lives by some doing something to those infected females with increased their project. Okay. The most embarrassing part of this talk is, I can tell you with complete confidence that almost all Wolbachia are mutualistic. Okay. Professor Torelli, what are they doing for their hosts? Answer, something. <laughs> you know, we know that at some level they can protect some Wolbachia can protect against some parasites. So when we put Wolbachia from Melanogaster into Aedes aegypti, the dengue virus can't grow in the aegypti. So that's why the uh, transformed Wolbachia, the transformed Aedes aegypti, the Aedes aegypti transformed with Melanogaster Wolbachia don't transmit dengue because they suppress, suppress the dengue virus. But in general, we don't know anymore. I mean, it's the wild west. I mean, I can I can show you, but in terms of natural history, that they have to be mutualistic. But I can't explain to you what the mutualism is. Uh, blah blah. <laughs> um, yeah. So if Wolbachia don't cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, now it's a trivial haploid model where uh, all we have is two parameters, the level of imperfect transmission and the relative dependency of infected females, you'll only get a stable equilibrium if those infections, if, if the relative fitness of the infected females is bigger than one. We know among the things that we'll want you to do is virus protection. We know in some cases they provide vitamins to the host. But most things that they do that are mutualistic remain to be described. But how do we know that they're mutualistic? Answer, well, they have to be if they don't cause CI and they spread. So when Ari did his first survey of Australian simulants back in the early 90s, he found WAU, this non-CI causing Wolbachia, to be rare everywhere on the east coast of Australia. Follow up work by Bill Ballard four years later found, found the populations to be at intermediate frequency. They've definitely gone up. Four years later, four years later, what I think of as my Wolbachia, the one from California, WRI, named after Riverside, invades Tasmania near Melbourne and up in Cairns. And then, already being a good boy, follows these populations and we see WRI displacing WAU. How does that make sense? How does that make sense? It makes sense only, first, this non-CI Wolbachia can only spread if it's doing something for this female, if it somehow enhances the female. We know they're protected against viruses. We don't know what else to do. How can WRI, my Wolbachia, spread on top of that? 
it causes CI uh, against that, but that's not enough to make it spread uh, unless it has a greater fitness advantage to the host. You can do algebra on this and get conditions in terms of the uh, relative fecundity of Wabakia infected with Riverside, internal transmission rate. It has to be bigger to spread when it's rare. It has to be bigger than uh, the, the relative fecundity of WAU, the non CI Wabakia. So the fact that this non CI causing Wabakia spreads in the rare and WRI spread on top of it suggests that this one is even more mutualistic, but we still don't know exactly what it's doing to the host. We know it's protected from viruses, but we can't prove in nature that that's sufficient. There have been some experiments showing it's provided vitamins, but we really don't fully understand. Okay. Once again. Uh, reproductive effects. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on Drosophila. About half of the Wabachia, the Drosophila species that we've studied, uh, have Wabachia, and half of those cause, cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, a few cause the outcome. Many have no discernible reproductive effects. Uh, how did species go? I have a species that has Wolbachia. How did it get it? How did it get it? There are three possibilities. It got it cladogenically. <laughs> so it's the species that gave rise to it had it, and it's persisted in the lineage. It got it because of introgression, mating between a close related species to hat. It's passed maternally with mitochondria. Or Jesus did it when nobody's looking. It's somehow horizontally moved. So how do we do it? Microinjection, parasitoids. I mean, there are all sorts of things. Parasitic insects. It's the dirty, dirty needle hypothesis. Uh, how do we test? How do we test for the relative frequencies? Well, we build phylogenies. We build not just phylogenies. We build cladograms for Wolbachia, mitochondria, and the hosts. If it's cladogenic transmission, we should have, we should have concordant cladograms. That's not trivial <laughs> because we don't exactly have a molecular clock. We've got the other tenfold swap in rates of substitution. So it's a bit hard to test them. Uh, Introgression, uh, we see that the trees associated with Wolbachia and mitochondria are much shallower, shallower than the nuclear trees and possibly discordant with the nuclear, nuclear trees. Or horizontal transmission, uh, we see uh, concordance between hosts and mitochondria, but Wolbachia are discordant and much shallower. So uh, let's do it. Uh, so for the last five years, or I think seven years now, my preoccupation has been sequencing hosts, Wolbachia and, and nuclear gene. Nuclear gene. The Wolbachia, what I like about Wolbachia, it has a starter genome, this 1.4 megabases. It's really easy. I mean, you just sequence the, the host and you get the Wolbachia for free. Um, many Wolbachia, and, and the surprise from that, and there was no way to know that before we had good sequences, is that many Wolbachia are recently acquired. Almost all. We only have, of the like 50 systems that we studied in, in Trisafa, only one seems to be cladogenic transmission. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is, you know, as I say, I'm just a lucky person. So, uh, what, seven or eight years ago, I got my first and I, you know, by the time I fucking grew up, got a real grant, got an NIH grant. Uh, you know, being an intrepid field worker, I walked all the way down the hall to my friend Dave the Ben's lab and asked him for flies that I could analyze. Dave had Drosophila suzukii and Drosophila subcuprella. Suzuki is this famous pest species that's invaded North America relatively recently. We looked and it has Wolbachia. 
We get sequencing. And what Wolbachia does it have? It has fucking my Wolbachia. It has the, essentially the same Wolbachia that are in that are in Drosophila singular. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> then we looked at this, this its sister species, Supercrel, and it had Wolbachia too. What we thought, based on MLS, so Jack Waring developed this beautiful system, these five loci, he developed primers for five Wolbachia loci that you could get out of any Wolbachia and build trees and so on. But the MLS2 loci were completely indistinguishable. So we thought this maybe corresponded to platogenic transmission. Uh, anyway, we didn't know. We started building trees and calibrating the trees, and we showed that the Wolbachia trees are much, much, much shallower. So, so WRI, that's in simulants. This is Suzuki I. Suzuki I is separated. Suzuki I is separated from uh, uh, the Lanagaster at a, I believe on the order of five million years. These are separated by uh, maybe a couple million years, but they're Wolbachia. No way in hell they're more diverse than 10,000. And that's been the story ever since then. Finding loads of examples, loads of examples, details, we published all the all of the published stories. Uh, we've just gone through nuclear mitochondrial and Wolbachia genomes to estimate. Okay, okay. Going in the wrong direction. So there's no substitute for good luck. And they say I'm a lucky person. Uh, so besides, you know, I'm mean, I'm an intrepid field worker. I walk both ways down my hall. I go in one direction to the Bennett's lab, I go in the other direction to Art Jim Cox's lab. Art Jim gives us all these species that he has. We look at 29 uh, Wolbachia infected Drosophila species, and on the order of 180 uh, Drosophila species. Uh, we find, we find, in addition to Suzuki, I, Sophocrella, at least five other species have Wolbachia that are very closely related to my Wolbachia, the one we initially discovered in, in uh, Riverside. So here's the phylogeny. So everybody knows and loves the Melanogaster group of flies, 100, 180 species. Uh, they span from the Melanogaster subgroup to the Ananasi subgroup on the order of 10 to 50 million years. If you look at their, if you look at their Wolbachia, these are all I'm highlighting species that have Wolbachia very closely related to the one we initially found in signals. Our best estimate is that they they had a common ancestor on the order of 16,000 years, 16,000 years ago. Well, Wolbachia moving around those things. So O'Neill back in the old days showed this gorgeous, but nobody had any idea how young most Wolbachia infections are. They're moving around like crazy. Uh, we know that my Wolbachia was almost certainly acquired from this very distantly related species, Drosophila and an okay. No way in hell you could cross things separated by that much time. That's parasitoids. But for close related species, this is all introduction. I won't get to that story. <laughs> right. Uh, we know, so the other reason that makes this possible now is that Beckman identified the CI mode. We know that the CI mode is one of the sets of uh, uh, poison and an antidote. It's a poison and an antidote. What we see over and over is that the poison becomes dysfunction. Many loss of function mutations. So now everybody's seeking for Wolbachia. Many loss of function mutations in the poison, never a loss of function mutation in the antidote. Uh, this is all beautifully summarized from Frank Chicken's lab at Cambridge, uh, showing. This rapid turnover of the CI causing and protecting those. The causing loci are constantly becoming dysfunctional. The protecting loci 
never become a uh, Theory papers back in 1970. Yeah. So, why is cytoplasmic incompatibility so common? I say palpable blocking infections cause it. It's constantly being lost. Why does it persist and why is it so common? Uh, so it implies about half of the robotic infections that are identified cause the eye. Few observations. Most of those robotic infections, so it's doing it's doing chronograms based on calibration for robotic mitochondria and post genes. Most seem to be quite young on the order of thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of years. And on the order of 50% of those infections. So young meaning the species that has it now got it relatively recently, didn't get it when it arose as a species, but it required it horizontally to do its expression. Uh, the fact that they're so young motivates uh, an epidemiological analysis of the relative frequency of CI positive infections. So I told you the WRI story. Brandon Cooper and I and Ari Hoffman are walking through hundreds of Drosophila species now. So the story I told you, so this is the Wolbachia uh, biogram across, across all kinds of Drosophila lids. And this is a phylogeny of the Wolbachia that fall into two different groups. What we see is that closely related Wolbachia on the order of 10,000 years occupy very distant related hosts. That's not just true of my Wolbachia, but also of WML like Wolbachia. Here it's on the order of 100,000 years, but much, much shallower than the time scale of species. Anyway, we'll go. Yeah, and, and Brandon is doing this beautiful field work with Daniel the Two Tank on uh, Sao Tome, where he knew Drosophila of the Melanogaster species group was found. Uh, and what they're seeing is that these very similar Wolbachia are moving across many different Drosophilids and non Drosophila insects. Okay? Wolbachia are moving rapidly among hosts. And here's our one example. So we're studying this group called the Blontium species group, it has about, it has about 80 species. We have one example of clinical, apparently clinical Wolbachia. Uh, yeah. CI causing Wolbachia are all very common. Non CI causing Wolbachia tend to be rare. Many species show heterogeneous frequencies across populations, suggesting that the spatial spread that Ari and I saw in 85 is not a rare phenomenon. It's happening all the time in nature. People just aren't looking for it. Okay, so what my story. What's my story about the evolution of CI? Uh, well, the first conjecture, come on, we're, we're all evolutionists. Uh, obviously, natural selection carries CI. Wrong. <laughs> you can do the trivial algebra and show that that's not true. The first suggestion, and that was first done by my colleague Tim Pratt, I generalized Tim's analysis. My graduate student, Ralph Hager, did it in subdivided population. Natural selection does not pay recycling. Uh, Greg Hurst and Gil Matini, when they were postdocs, came up with the idea that cytoplasmic incompatibility is favored by some sort of clade selection. And they thought that CI allowed Wolbachia to get in the new taxa, assuming, and that is true, assuming that Wolbachia is deleterious, but they seem not to be. I am fucking up for a kind of time. This is, this is my theory paper from. A couple of decades ago, you can compete Wolbachia in a population that cause different levels of CI, produce different propensity effects, have different levels of return transmission. CI is no natural selection. What natural selection cares about is propensity times a fraction of female factors, and that's true even if you have population so Okay. Kirsten McBean postulated that CI helps Wolbachia get into new hosts. 
If Wolbachia are deleterious, they need CI to get into new host, but in general, they're not deleterious. Yeah, that's John says it's talked over. <laughs> so shoot, man, I'm a bad person. All right. So for deleterious Wolbachia, what's the probability of fixation of the newly introduced Wolbachia to a population of size 100? Well, unless you have CI, the chances are zero. The chances are zero. So, yeah. On the other hand, if you have favorable Wolbachia, the level of CI, so this is no CI to pre CI, has almost no effect on the probability of invasion. But what do Wolbachia do? What Wolbachia do is let the infection, sorry, what cytoplasmic incompatibility does is let the infection persist even if it becomes deleterious. When we introduced Wolbachia in the 80s gypsy, those Wolbachia infected females produce 20% fewer eggs than uninfected females. What do we have to do? We have to introduce enough to get them above the unstable point, which is about 20%. Once we do, they're stably established, even though they're less fit, because cytoplasmic incompatibility wipes out the offspring of the uninfected females. So, I say CI is so common because it increases the frequency of Wolbachia within hosts and it increases the persistence time of Wolbachia hosts, even when initially favorable Wolbachia becomes deleterious. So here's some theory about that. Uh, this is published in 1963, but this is the minimum frequency of a Wolbachia infection of favorable robotic infection with a function of cytoplasmic incompatibility. Appreciable cytoplasmic incompatibility makes a frequency of these 0.8. Um, yeah, why is that? Those are this. This is a simulation studying how long a robotic infection is expected to persist if it's sometimes favorable and sometimes deleterious. Answer with CI. This is the level of cytoplasmic incompatibility. This is a very strong CI. A little bit of CI dramatically increased persistence times if Wolbachia is sometimes deleterious. We can build an epidemiological model, and I'm almost finished, I promise. We can build an epidemiological model, which was first done by Jack Mayer in the winter in 2000. We look at the fraction. So now it's a population of species. What fraction of insect species are infected with Wolbachia? We have a transmission rate, and we have a loss rate. What I've done is taken this model and to get an equilibrium fraction of species infected that depends on the loss rate, the ratio of loss rate to transmission rate. It's about a half, so we take this parameter. This parameter is about the opposite. Gamma is about half of beta. You can generalize that. I'm almost finished. To have Wolbachia that either cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, I, or don't cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. Now that we know what the loci are, we can look at those cassettes and see that they're constantly being lost in lineages that cause. Uh, in Wolbachia lineage on a very rapid time scale, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Both two things are happening. Hosts are suppressing CI and Wolbachia are losing CI. You can do a simple model and get the equilibrium. Uh, that equilibrium is consistent with half of Wolbachia being uninfected, half the species being uninfected and half of the robotic infection causing CI. <laughs> so I'll stop. Uh, why is cytoplasmic incompatibility the common? Natural selection isn't the answer. Within a host lineage, the robotic that cause more CI have no fitness advantage. So the clade selection based on equilibrium frequencies, the higher the frequency for the species, the more likely it is to be transmitted horizontally. And persistent times in the face of fluctuating fitness effects. Conclusions CI causing Wolbachia are pervasive because they tend to be at much higher 
frequencies and they persist this longer. Hence, they're prevalent because they have both a transmission advantage and a persistence advantage. Sorry for going to crash. But I have, you know, I have to talk for like 15 years. <laughs> so that's my story. I'm sticking. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we'll take questions from the audience and then we'll look at the chat. Yeah. So what did you choose Dengue Fever? Oh, you know, yeah. That, that was, yeah, that was O'Neill. Uh, so Dengue Fever, because it's host. Okay, why Dengue Fever as opposed to malaria? Answer, Dengue is transmitted basically by only two species, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. In most parts of the world, it's transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti does not have Wolbachia naturally. Scott's postdoc, one of Scott's postdocs showed that, that um, Wolbachia protected Drosophila from natural viruses. This is actually first, sh first shown by this Australian guy whose name I'm blocking on, who was postdoc with Mike Ashburner at Cambridge. That's what led to the explosion. When people realized that Wolbachia could protect Drosophila against viruses, naturally occurring viruses, and said, fuck me, <laughs> maybe we can use this uh, to suppress viruses that are, that are transmitted by other insects. And we found, and Scott found this insect that wasn't infected, got Wolbachia we'll in, it protected. Bill and Linda gave him $20 million. So I'm also wondering, are there any other uh, vertebrates that are affected? Is these why I find Wolbachia the way that fever causes? Oh, sorry. So, Wolbachia are only in inverted. So, so you know, uh, we've no, all no, been injected with Wolbachia constantly. Our immune system, yeah. they're, they're, so we, yeah, Wolbachia yeah. can't live in us or any vertebrate. Yeah. Did you ever find evidence of cell infection? Yes, yes. And, um, and, uh, and to Fritids, uh, there's, there's a cherry fruit fly in, in Austria infected, co-infected with seven different Wolbachia. My model assumes zero or one. And that's true for the vast majority of hosts, but some hosts have many. So and that's, for instance, in Australia, where you found that transmission of frequencies, there wasn't evidence of co-infection. Um, no, in Australia, all those flies had either WAU or WRI, and it was a displacement process. Some trophidids have many Wolbachia. And there's one example in Drosophila simulans in, uh, in the South Pacific that has two Wolbachia, and I've always meant to go there to figure out why. Uh, yeah. Like on a similar line, do you think that like your Wolbachia is going to drive these other ones to extinction? Or? Uh, so the Wolbachia. Uh, 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 so some Wolbachia are much better at moving between between taxa and you know R and I are both lucky people. I mean the Wolbachia. So we found WRI together. He found WML. We've now looked at on the order of eighty Drosophila species, and most of them have close relatives in one one or the other. So they seem to be super powerful spreaders for reasons we did not understand. So uh, I have a, a question about um, in cases where it's conferring a fitness advantage, okay, which seems to happen often. Um, why is it that they're always so young? I mean, if they're good for the host, why don't they persist for a long time? Yeah, great question. So uh, yes. So here's a here's a bullshit possibility. It's not a bullshit possibility. There are data saying that the hosts, first of all, there are several examples we found out, starting with Drosophila and Nassim, where the Wolbachia genome gets integrated into the host. So I think in many cases, if the Wolbachia is doing something good, the host says, fuck you, give me these genes, I'm going to get rid of them. So I think we'll see more examples 
or movements of the useful cassettes. I mean, just like, you know, viruses playing these games with bacteria, there's these cassettes are move, moving around and often you know, the virus is not persistent. So very early days, but that's the case. That, um, sort of related to that, there are herbivorous flies, or herbivorous prosocola. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, there are all these stories about endosymbionts and things like aphids that confer fitness advantages through nutrition to the, the, the host. Yeah. Um, does Wolbachia do anything like that and yeah. Staphylomyza? So it looks, there, there are examples of Wolbachia specifically providing B vitamins. But there are examples of Wolbachia. In filarial nematodes, Wolbachia have become obligate siblings. And they're in filarial nematodes, it's co phylogenous, concordant co phylogenous to the Wolbachia and the hosts. And the nematodes become sterile and put their Wolbachia away. And there's one example of that uh, in a natural uh, So there are a bunch of tricks here. Yeah, there's one. Is there a question yeah, in the yeah, chat? Could read that. Yeah. I wonder if there's a difference in timing of Wolbachia infection, CI versus non CI, how Wolbachia occurs on your phylogenetic cyst type drive and result of differential persistence. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, wow, great question. Yes. So uh, this is among the questions that we're looking at now. With so we now have the machinery all all ready to sort of build uh, chronograms for the Wolbachia and to do comparison uh, of this. Uh, what we expect is that in general the non-CI positive Wolbachia will will have much lower persistence times, um, but that's just a story. That's what. You know, that's what I'd like to be true to explain it using this model right now. Bill, Steve, I haven't seen you in years. Hi, right, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, timing of infection. Yeah. So we're, we're starting to build all these chronograms now and map CI. So we, you know, we just had the CI load time in the last couple of years. This is, you know, ask, ask Brandon to come and give a talk in, in a couple of years. So he'll explain all of this. I'll be there. <laughs> so um, the one thing I forgot to say is that Michael is around the MBZ periodically in the office next to mine. And so there are uh, other opportunities to interact with him and ask him questions. So maybe we'll end there and uh, thank you once again for a super interesting talk.